In this video, what I want to do is look at some of the more recent additions to the Intermorphic Sound Engine, the IRC. In particular, what I'm going to look at in some depth is the Macro Oscillator, which is the latest oscillator to be added to the IRC. And I'll also look at some of the enhancements and improvements to the uh, LFO control unit. What this isn't is a kind of get started with the ISC video. Uh, I'm going to assume that you're fairly up to date with the basics of the ISC and how to use it. Um, so I'm just going to get stuck into what's changed and what you can do with it. So let's go. OK, so let's look at the macro oscillator first. Uh, a little bit of history. Um, the macro oscillator is based on a hardware module that was produced a few years back by Mutable Instruments. Uh, it's their Braids Eurorack module. And what this is, is it's basically a very um, elegant library of lots of different methods and approaches to synthesis and sound generation um, that are all made selectable and they're fairly carefully curated so that you've just got sort of two points of modulation for each macro. Um, because it's based on braids you can use the online resources for more in-depth information about it and in particular, I would strongly recommend uh, you get yourself a copy of the Illustrated Guide to Braids, which was produced by the, uh, the very clever Bob Boris. Um, the Illustrated Guide goes through each macro in detail and uh, highlights exactly what the two controls do and also even gives you a bit of history about where the concept for this particular model of synthesis has come from. Um, and I'll kind of try and refer to that as we go along. So anyway, there's the macro oscillator. Um, you've got the, the the standard controls for most of the ISC tone generator modules. Uh, but the three things that are important are the shape, which is where you select the macro that you want to use. And as you can see, there's 46 of them. Um, and then for each of them, there's a modulatable parameter that corresponds to the knobs on the original braids module. Um, the first knob was uh, labelled timbre and the second was labelled colour. Now as, as a rule of thumb, timbre is probably the, the primary modulation destination for you. It usually makes the biggest impact on sound, although there are some exceptions to that. Um, the the colour control tends to be more uh, flexible and is often a kind of set and forget thing. There's uh, different points where it does different things throughout its range of travel. Again, depending on the macro that's in use. This video would be very long if I ran through all of them in turn. So what I'm just going to do is pick out uh, a few of probably my favourite macros um, and highlight what they do and how the controls change as you go through uh, the different shape macro shapes. Um, so I'll start with the the sine triangle because that really is one of my favourites. Um, this is basically a simple wave folder. If you've not encountered wave folders before, basically what they do is they take a a simple waveform like a sine wave or a triangle, and bend it back on itself. And the number of folds you get within the wave by doing that increases the harmonic content. Um, so if I just start, we'll start with the sine, and then as you can see, if you as you raise the timbre, you increase the number and the depth of the folds. 
What the, uh, the colour does on this uh, macro is it morphs the basic wave from a sine to a triangle, which gives you a much finer control over the harmonics. So you can get some really quite subtle things going on, which is rather nice. Looking at a different macro, um, one of the things that the macro oscillator introduces pretty much for the first time in the ISC is some kind of uh, frequency modulation. Um, now, technically, this is actually phase modulation. The difference between the two doesn't really uh, matter other than to say that the advantages of phase modulation is it holds its pitch with the depth of the uh, the modulation and also you get a much better and tighter bass response than you do with just straight analog FM. Um, so this is a, a really good macro if you want to do some nice bass sounds. Um, Tambra in this case controls the uh, the depth of the the frequency or the phase modulation, what's called the FM index, and colour uh, controls the harmonic ratio because obviously with all modulation techniques you usually have two sources, um, a carrier and a modulator, and the frequency ratio between those two things gives you very very different results depending on where you want to set it. So again if I just hit the scale and again, we start with a sine wave. We're now basically FMing it with a slightly detuned version of itself. But now if we start to sweep the colour and change the ratio between the modulation and the carrier, If you listen to that, that's quite an important thing, because with frequency modulation and phase modulation, when the relationship between the two oscillators is a whole number, an integer ratio, then the new tones that you produce are all harmonically related to each other. So what you get is a very tidy melodic sound like this. If the harmonic ratio is fractional, then you get aharmonic sounds, which is great for bells and things like that. And some, sometimes it, um, you know, will work with melodic sounds depending on how you want to uh, program them. But as the sweep through, you'll hear when we hit the integer ratios. To save you hunting for these, what I've done is I've put together a small text file um, that lists approximately which values of the colour slider correspond to integer ratios of these uh, two oscillators. I'll put a link to that in the notes for this video. Uh, you might want to download it. It's got some other information in that as well, of other settings for the colour slider that I'll come to in a bit. But anyway, that's, that's phase modulation or frequency modulation for you. Okay, what I'm looking at now is the, uh, the some of the physical models that are uh, in the macro oscillator. I'll take the string physical model. Uh, the reason I'm picking on these is because, just to highlight the point, that with the physical models, you'll probably want to defeat the amplitude envelope 
basically set it to as you see here so that it's not really doing a great deal the reason for that is because the physical models have their own natural decay um, so you don't want the envelope to get in the way of that necessarily This physical model is based on uh, a system called Car plus Strong Synthesis, which is basically a, a tune delay that's fed some noise. And the timbre controls the damping of the string model and the colour substitutes for the pluck position. Um, so that, you know, a guitar sounds different when it's plucked at the bridge than when it's plucked over the soundboard and plucked on the neck. So if we start it, you're not going to hear a lot at the moment because the damping's so low. In fact, you're not going to hear anything. There we go. And then we'll increase the damping. And you'll see what I mean about the natural decay. That we've just got the envelope set wide, but the damping parameter is controlling how the model actually behaves. You get some kind of cording on this model for some reason. The last model that I want to look at are some of the uh, wavetables. Um, I'll, ta I'll take the uh, the wave map linear. Again, if you're not familiar with it, uh, this is a former synthesis that was um, first came out in the in the mid '80s, and basically what it does is it places um, a set of waveforms in a in a grid like pattern, and so what that means is you can jump to each different wave simply by um, defining its um, its coordinates, its x and y coordinates. Um, and that's what this particular model does. It maps the, the waves to, I think it's a 16 by 16 grid. Um, and this is an example of where the, um, where the sliders do very uh, similar things. Um, so the timbre determines the coordinate on the x-axis of the wavetable and the colour determines the coordinate on the Y. So, again, if we start it. So as we go up here, we'll go up the X-axis. One of the nice things about this is that the <clears throat> The boundaries between the waves are interpolated, they're smooth, so you kind of morph from one to the other. So now if we bring in the Y, I'm going to come back to this particular macro uh, a bit later on uh, to look at one way of using this XY using some of the new additions to the LFO unit. Uh, but now maybe it's a good time to move on and look specifically at what's changed in the LFO unit. Okay. Uh, this is is I've just set it up very simply so that the uh, the macro oscillator sets to a simple uh, subtractive macro, and uh, this gives an opportunity to have a look at the LFO. Um, the changes to the LFO are quite subtle, but they're very important. Uh, superficially, it looks the same as as the LFO has done for a long time. You've got you know the different uh, basic shapes. Uh, you can select 
minimum maximum um, phase. But let's talk about the new additions. First new addition is the random shape. If you set it to this, then what you get is uh, basically as a stepped random value that spat out at whichever frequency you've set the LFO to. It's important at this point to say something about uh, polarity. Because LFOs are oscillators, they have both a positive and a negative uh, output, depending on where the oscillator is in its cycle. If you go back to the macro oscillator, you'll see that the sliders only work in a positive way. They range from zero up to 100%. So if you have your slider at zero and give it a negative value, nothing's going to happen. So for that reason, when you're modulating the macro oscillator, you will probably want to bring the LFO minimum value up to zero, i.e. you just have the LFO spitting out positive values. Obviously, if you're wanting to modulate around a particular range of parameter, if you've set it to, to you know, like that, 0.5, then a negative value will be useful to take it down to three or up to seven. Um, so then you'd adjust the minimum to allow those kind of things. Um, but as a rule, if you just want to modulate in one direction on the macro oscillator, then set the minimum values to zero and you'll get something predictable. So anyway, back to this random type. Uh, it's a stepped random value that comes out at the frequency of the LFO, as I say. If you want to modulate the macro slider on its full range from zero to one, then you need to put the value of the level of the LFO up to around about six decibels. That will make sure that when the LFO is at its maximum, the modulation value will push the macro oscillator slider to its maximum as well. So at a simple level, this is basically just a, a sample and hold kind of thing. Um, so that's why I put it on to do the traditional sample and hold thing, which is making a filter frequency bounce around like this. Okay, so that's doing that at an arbitrary rate set by the frequency. Another option of doing a very similar thing is to select the square and tick this new box which says random levels. Again, this does what it says on the tin. If you tick it, then the LFO will give you a random level based on the minimum and maximum that you've set. So in this case, it will sound exactly the same as the random does. The advantage of using a standard type to do this is you can sync them to the BPM of the overall piece, which, you know, if you're doing something to grid, then that's a very useful thing. If you sync it, then obviously that slider has no value, does nothing at all. The other thing about this is it works on all types of uh, LFO shapes. So if you wanted to slew it, use a triangle rather than a square. Wow, 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 wow,
Okay, it's a wawa thing. A random wawa. Or a sword. It's rising. And a sword falling. So, that's what you can do with the, the random levels. And that's a new feature. Another new feature, which is very useful, is the note on random. OK, what this does is it, in effect, completely disables the frequency and the BPM uh, settings. It simply means that every time you send a new note through the synthesizer engine, this puts out a random value. Uh, it won't do anything else until a new note appears. When the next note comes, you'll get another random value. And again, it's, it's a value based on um, whatever you've set there for the minimum and maximum. So, here we go. So that's new random value at every note on. Why is that important? Well, because it's note-based, or it's off the grid, this works for any type of voice. It will work for rhythmic voices, but most importantly, it will work for random voices. So if you want something to happen inside the ISE um, on the start of, a, of an ambient-type voice, then the note on random is a really good way to trigger that. Uh, and again, this is a new addition because previously, although we've had beat to, uh, we've had sync to beat uh, BPM, which syncs events in the ISE to whatever the beat grid is, we've not had a, an easy way to synchronize random events in the ISE to notes that are just time based, that are off grid. So this is really valuable. Um, and let me show you some possible uses for that. Going back to the wavetable oscillator, what I've done here is I've set up the um, the macro oscillator is, is back on my wavetable map. And these two LFOs are together. Um, one is modulating the, uh, the timbre, the X axis, and the other is modulating the color, the Y axis. And they're both set to uh, note on random. So what this means is that every time we get a new note on, they'll generate a new value and we'll jump to a different point in the wavetable grid. So what means is that every time we get a new note, um, we get a new timbre. And that's actually a technique I was using at the piece in the uh, in the start of this, uh, where we're again. If you look there, there's the the macro oscillator using the wavetable map with two LFOs, which are both modulating the x and y axis, uh, and it's corded. So what happens is that when you play it, and particularly when it's uh, when it is corded you get some lovely uh, changes in timbre. One other example, just to uh, give a demonstration, it's not just about the macro oscillator, of using this feature, um, I've done here. What I've done is I've just set up a very uh, simple and boring um, hi-hat sequence of just 16th notes. Um, and we've just got the drum synth 
um, doing an electro hi hat. So, which is dull. If I switch it to the other channel, we've got exactly the same patch, but we're using the note on to modulate different parameters on the drum synth. I think is a lot more interesting. So there you have it. That's a short overview of some of the new features in the ISC. Um, hopefully you found that useful. Uh, if you've got any questions, anything you want to ask me, or if there are any uh, other videos you'd like me to do, then mention them in the comments and I'll see what I can do. Hope you have fun. Thanks for watching.